Okay, what's up, everybody? It's Kyle again with another episode of Hillsboro and Hundred and Real. We have uh, my good friend, Dr. Andre Espinoza. He was on the show back in early summer, I believe, and uh, he's just a wealth of knowledge, great guy to talk to. So we got a lot of cool stuff on the list today. So Andre, thanks for being with me again, buddy. Yeah, always, always a pleasure, Kyle. Man, I, I, I enjoy catching your show. I never catch it live because I'm always working, but I always catch it later <laughs> on. <laughs> and I and, uh, thank you for doing this, and guys. Andre's got a, a very busy schedule. That's why we're doing this at a different time. But uh, you know, he was able to fit it in. And uh, so, why don't you just kind of catch us up? Or, um, you know, what you've been up to for people that didn't catch the last one or they caught the last one. You, you guys, you guys have been busy throughout this whole pandemic you, you haven't shut down you're still serving your your clients uh kind of give us a rundown of what's going on over at, at your place yeah sure i mean you know the the, the pandemic-esque you know environment kind of struck you know i think most uh you know most individuals and also obviously downstream the small businesses um you know when it took effect and then the lockdown went into effect but uh we we were still working throughout the entire thing you know my office closed for a short period of time uh, while we kind of mulled over and figured out how to continue, um, you know, serving our, our, our patients. Uh, you know, we went to that universal kind of, you know, Zoom thing, which we very quickly realized, you know, it's the type of thing that we did for a month and we hope we never do again. Uh, it's supposed to be the future of medicine. And honestly, it's like going back 10,000 years where you can't interact with a patient. You can't physically touch a patient, that human aspect of the patient is like completely out the window. So we didn't like it. Uh, the patients hated it. And uh, so we, we knew we needed to get back, you know, kind of moving again. So, uh, you know, we, we felt pretty compelled that we were an essential business, you know, just by the nature of what we do. So we, we opened up, you know, pretty early on and there was a lot of hesitancy. You know, some people were happy to come in. They couldn't wait to get into the office and others obviously had a lot of trepidation. Um, but we were also working the whole time. So myself and my nurse practitioner were pretty much in the hospital every day because we were managing COVID patients. You know, the hospital basically turned into a COVID facility. So, you know, we were over there just seeing COVID patients and, uh, you know, trying to keep safe and, uh, you know, going home every day and, you know, entering through the, you know, the basement and, you know, taking all the clothes off and <laughs> showering down there because my wife wouldn't let me in, you know, until I detoxed. I mean, it was that bad. Uh, but, you know, and then eventually, you know, things quiet down, you know, there's that initial like fear factor thing. And then people realize, all right, let, let, let's take a breath here. So, but yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're full, we're full, we're full speed ahead at this point. Cool, man. Very good. And, and uh, for those that did not get to listen to our first one, your specialty is interventional cardiology. Just kind of explain what that is to people that are unfamiliar with that term. Yeah, great question. So, you know, I basic fundamental training for any any physician is you've got to go through obviously four years of medical school, then you need to enter into some type of internal medicine or family medicine training. You do that for three up to four years. Uh, and then from that point, you, you make an attempt to specialize if you choose to. Some choose obviously to stay in those what are considered primary care uh, fields. So I'm a family doctor, an internist. Uh, I chose cardiovascular diseases as my uh, specialty path. So then I spent another three years uh, doing cardiovascular medicine uh, and then another additional two years of interventional medicine, which included uh, interventional cardiology, which is kind of the practice of using interventional mechanical techniques to, um, to treat blockages, heart attacks, strokes, et cetera, really ways of restoring blood flow to parts of the body that, that don't have any anymore. Um, and then endovascular medicine, which is kind of the specialty that, that focuses on what's called peripheral arterial disease. So plaque buildup and blockages outside of the heart area uh, in the legs and things of that nature. So you take a, a diabetic, for example, that, you know, has a wound on their foot and they don't have enough blood supply, you know, we're able to, to reestablish blood flow by using these interventional techniques. So that's what the interventional cardiologist does is we intervene on a process, but not using anything other than true mechanical uh, technology to do so. Very cool, man. Yeah. Very cool. And I know you're, you know, from people that my friends and family that have seen you, uh, they, they can't speak highly enough of what you do and how you care for them and, and mm -hmm. kind of give them peace of mind, which I think is one of the, you know, biggest things, right, that, that you can do for people. Uh, <laughs> mechanical is you giving them peace of mind that, hey, we can get through this. We're not going to, you know, yeah, your day hasn't come yet. Yeah. So, you know, and it's, uh, you talked to, uh, we'll start right there, Nick. You kind of talked about, you know, people that might have diabetes or whatnot. Can you just talk a little bit about, because something I teach a lot with fasting, insulin resistance and and, uh, and and 
tie that into uh, inflammation? Just speak a little bit about that, Andre. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's a, a lot of overlapping, you know, areas of discussion. Um, you know, I insulin, you know, obviously is a hormone, uh, you know, as you know, all too well, you know, it's responsible for specifically predominantly responsible for lowering blood sugar in the body, you know, and uh, ultimately at the end of the day, your, your body is only capable of handling um, so much, you know, in the way of mechanistic changes on a daily basis, the body is not designed to function at extremes. It likes symmetry. It prefers to have balance. Um, you know, and generally speaking, what you'd like to see when people are eating, for example, throughout the course of the day, um, is you'd like to see people's glucose levels rise kind of like, you know, the tide, you know, kind of comes and goes in a sine wave. Um, and the reason why, you know, that's good is that because you don't then require large amounts of insulin to drive that sugar down into the cells, um, because that ends up being problematic when you have elevated circulating levels of insulin. So people like, you know, you take, for example, something common to everybody, you have some Chinese food, you know, someone eats a, a Chinese food, you know, chicken and broccoli with an egg roll, you know, we've all been there, you know, and that spikes, you know, your sugar levels. And you're really trying to avoid those tremendous spikes because that drives, obviously, the insulin has to match that level of circulating uh, blood glucose. Um, and you're basically putting the body on overdrive and the body's really good. It can sustain itself over a period of time, but uh, ultimately, you know, the body's mechanisms become less adaptive. Um, and when you have circulating levels of glucose in the body, for example, that leads to a tremendous amount of inflammation, which, you know, I can't overemphasize enough. Probably the thing that's talked least about, you know, in the cardiovascular arena, um, not in all circles, but in most circles, you know, simply because people haven't necessarily kept up to speed with what really the main purveyor of most chronic illness is, um, which is inflammation inside of the body. Um, and inflammation does all the worst things in the world. And it's been associated with just about every acute and chronic ailment, um, you know, which is what we in this country in particular suffer from. And it kind of lends into that you know, theoretically, we want to live longer, right? There's that lifespan thing, how long do I live? But then more importantly, there's that health span thing, right? How long do I live well? You know, are your last 10 years of your life, you know, with an IV in the hospital, getting medications and swallowing 3000 pills a day, you know, or your last, you know, 10 years of your life is still playing with your grandkids and, you know, you're out there in the kayak and hiking the mountains, you know, and there's a big difference between the two. And I think people, you know, misconstrue what those are. Um, you know, so th those are two purveyors of, of the worst thing in the world, you know, as you alluded to, which is the, the inflammatory process, which then sets up the nidus, you know, for all these chronic ailments to occur. Excellent. So with, uh, I was actually teaching one of the panda lessons last night, and correct me if, 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 if I'm wrong with this, but I always look at inflammation and insulin resistance is, is one can drive, the, they can both drive each other. Like inflammation can drive insulin resistance, insulin resistance can drive inflammation. So it can almost become a vicious cycle, right? Correct. Back and forth and people are too stressed, not getting enough sleep, uh, you know, whatever it is causing inflammation, that's going to lead to problems with their uh, insulin management. Now talk about with blood work. Um, I know we talked about this in some of the seminars, but C-reactive protein, the importance of looking at that in blood work, why is that significant? Sure. Yeah. See, C-reactive protein specifically is what's termed as a non-specific marker of systemic inflammation. So, you know, obviously there's a normal value. Anything above that value is considered abnormal. Um, we use it now, ironically enough. I mean, the first articles on this were published 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, and it's amazing, you know, only within the last five or 10 years, again, that it's something that, you know, physicians are using routinely. Um, you know, we use it almost on a daily basis, you know, to, um, uh, to identify people as a risk enhancer, you know, so you have people that come in with the traditional risk factors like high blood pressure, diabetes, cigarette smoking, uh, things of that nature um, that everybody's familiar with. And then the way we try or attempt to risk stratify them is by obtaining additive information. And one of those simple blood markers is a C-reactive protein. Again, it's a nonspecific marker. It doesn't tell you if it's elevated where the inflammation is coming from. 
Um, and that's probably more the concerning thing because it's a systemic inflammatory process. It's not localized. So you can imagine that anything systemic is affecting every organ, every blood vessel, pretty much all the basic fundamental mechanistic things that occur in your body are now under duress. It tells you that your body is under significant degrees of duress and you need to correct that. Now, that could be directly associated to a medical condition. More often than not, I would argue, and we talk about this every day with our patients, it's a lack of exercise. It's a lack of things like intermittent fasting. It is a lack of appropriate nutritional intake and things like that, uh, which all lead to obesity, the metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance. <laughs> it just all comes back to the same thing all over again. And, and with that, uh, I love how you tie that together. The C-reactive protein, because uh, I want to go over cholesterol next, but uh, well, let's go over it and then I'll, I'll tie it back to see reactive protein. Talk just a little. I think a lot of people are they, they know the term cholesterol, but what is cholesterol? Why is it important for the body? And what are your views on cholesterol? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, you know, cholesterol at the end of the day, um, you know, is so vitally important, um, you know, for day to day function of the body's cellular mechanisms. Right. So your, your, your body needs cholesterol. Your body needs it so much it makes cholesterol. Right. So it's so vitally important um, within what's called the cellular matrix, uh, essentially, that allows appropriate function uh, for the body's basic fundamental mechanisms. Um, so the, the concepts of, you know, having no cholesterol or low cholesterol, things like that, you know, are a little disconnected with what ultimately we know uh, the body ultimately needs. Now, you know, there are people with elevated circulating levels of cholesterol. We do know that cholesterol does lead to inflammation. Um, it's important to understand that cholesterol in and of itself is not the story. It is one small piece of an extremely large complex story. So you do hear a lot, um, you know, a lot of focus, especially in the cardiovascular arena and the media, you know, you can't, you know, go through the day without reading something on how cholesterol is, is bad for you, you know, and then that drives you into that Well, you have to get your cholesterol treated. Um, you know, there, there's so much gray in there, you know, and we can spend hours talking about it, but you know, you take just cholesterol that you ingest. It's like when people tell you eggs are bad for you, you know, it's, it's such a bizarre thing when I hear comments like that. And they say that because it's, it's because it's got a lot of cholesterol. Well, there's no doubt about it. Absolutely. Eggs have cholesterol, just like they have more vitamin D, you know, than you can swallow in a pill, you know, with one single egg, as long as you eat the yolk, yeah. you know, but most people yeah. go to the egg white thing. And you know, so I, I don't, you know, I, I've read and I see where all these things come from. And listen, there's always two sides of the fence, right? You have always people on both sides. I think our challenge and our goal is to always stay in some form of centrist, you know, position because, you know, both sides, you know, have some reasonable arguments, but in reality, the truth is usually found somewhere in between. Um, so I think cholesterol is important, um, but it does lead to the release. For example, when you ingest cholesterol, of course, you have these little transport mechanisms that are called chylomicrons that kind of transport the cholesterol. And sometimes in abundance, they will get deposited in certain areas of the body, uh, in particular, sometime in blood vessels, but that's not necessarily what causes the heart attack. It's the secondary effects um, of other kind of signal cells that are called cytokines or chemokines that then release uh, and attract all the inflammatory cells. And that's, again, we keep going back to this inflammation thing. So the cholesterol is a problem, but it's what it does downstream to the body by attracting other bad actors, which usually come in the form of white blood cells. So leukocytes, um, interleukins, you know, again, which are tremendous inflammatory things. These are all things, you know, as we kind of full, come full circle, Again, they, they fit in that whole milieu of the, you know, the intermittent fasting concept and how do we reduce inflammation and exercise. So, um, you know, it's something that needs to be paid attention to. But again, it is one part of the story. It's not the entire part of the story. And you really need to be able to kind of, you know, discuss, you know, from A to Z that entire story in order to decide how best to approach an individual when you're treating them. Excellent. Uh, with, with cholesterol, um, couple of things that come to my mind, our brains utilize cholesterol to a large degree, correct? Correct. Important for brain function and then sex hormone production. So for let's use men as an example, 
especially if their past 25 testosterone levels are dropping. And if they get the doctor that says, hey, let's try to get this cholesterol as low as you possibly can. I mean, testosterone is going to pay a price for that, correct? Well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, I mean, cholesterol, you got to remember cholesterol, you know, the first part of it is choli, meaning bile. The latter part of it is sterile, right? That's it, it, it is the foundation of how hormones are created in the body, right? Testosterone, estradiol, all these different things, both for men and women alike. Um, so absolutely, it is a precursor to the development of hormones and the body requires that cholesterol in order to produce those hormones, absolutely. Cool, and, and cholesterol in the body, I've been studying this a lot, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, that's why I come to you for knowledge. Cholesterol <laughs> produced within the body is, is coming, is, um, from the liver, correct? Liver, correct. Yeah. So a healthy functioning liver is going to be critical for good cholesterol management as well, right? Absolutely. Cool. Um, now, if somebody gets their blood work back, and let's say based on the norms, cholesterol is high, but something like C-reactive protein is, is, is phenomenal, like it's really good. Is that a concern or are you looking at those two things combined, like inflammation and cholesterol levels? Uh, yeah, again, we, we try to look at everything in, in the context, you know, in isolation, but more importantly, absolutely, you always have to look at the, the, the larger picture. Um, and, you know, we get a lot of referrals for people with high cholesterol. Most of the time, they're, you know, patients that tend to be on the younger side. Um, and they have no other risk factors. You know, I've seen, you know, a bunch of athletes from your organization, you know, that are there, they're working out three to five times a week, they're doing the intermittent fasting. And for whatever reason, whether it's genetic or otherwise, you know, they, they, their cholesterol is quote unquote elevated. Um, and then, you know, they'll come see us, same thing, we'll order a C-reactive protein. We try to do what's called risk stratification. So we do have the ability, you know, um, to look at individuals and quantify their risk of something occurring to them from a cardiovascular standpoint over the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, because we have so much data now, you know, with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of patients to kind of predict, you know, who's really not going to do well and who's going to do well. You have to um, be a certain percentage risk in order for us to even have the conversation about a treatment um, and then be more importantly, um, the things that we know that are going to lower your cholesterol. Now, some people are very unlucky, right? They have what's called familial hypercholesterolemia. They were born with it. And there's absolutely very little that you can do about it. We do have some advanced pharmacologies now for that. And those people have exceptional risk moving forward from a cardiovascular standpoint, but that's a less than 1% of the population. A lot of people are floating around out there with high cholesterol levels. Um, but I would argue most of them don't need to be treated. What most people need is a really good hardcore conversation about, look, yes, if this persists for the next 20 years of your life, and then you develop diabetes, and then your blood pressure shoots up, and you're not exercising, and you're morbidly obese, and you're smoking cigarettes, listen, you're a time bomb, right? You know, the, you, that, that's just a matter of time. And we, we, there's basically two pathways, and that's one. And the other one is the people that are at risk because their cholesterol technically is high, but in reality, they don't need treatment because they're doing all the other anti-inflammatory things that we know will reduce the likelihood of them experiencing what's called a cardiovascular event. And that's why I spend most of my day either saying, hey, listen, you know, this is where I work out. That's where you got to go, um, you know, over to New Old Fitness or, you know, you have got to engage in the two drugs, the greatest drugs in the history of the world, exercise and nutrition, right? We've talked about this endlessly. And I look at people because they're asking for, you know, how do I do? What do I do? You know, and, and they want a drug or they want an easy way out. You know, in reality, I say, listen, the beautiful thing about this conversation, um, I get to inform you, you're the one who has to, you know, pull up the bootstraps and the responsibility is all on you, but you get to do it. And if you do it, you don't have to swallow 10 pills for the rest of your life. You know, and that's the conversation that we have all day, every day. And uh, so, no, simply because you have high cholesterol does not mean you need to be treated. Um, if you have high inflammation, again, the irony is the two things that we prescribe first are not drugs. We talk about exercise, nutrition, weight loss, intermittent fasting, all of these things that have been definitively shown and cost you, by the way, absolutely nothing other than a gym membership, right? You know, and, and a little bit of time at the grocery store making good selections. And that's a breath of fresh air coming from a doctor of your stature, because we're, not to go too far down that path, but with everything going on with COVID, right? I haven't heard any of these health experts on TV say anything 
regarding nutrition, sunlight, sleep, exercise. <laughs> so you put on a mask, wait for the vaccine. I'm like, that's not health. It's not, you know, but it's, it's good to hear that from you. Um, you know, well, listen, I mean, you, you, I mean, I see it every day, right? I mean, you call it the pandemic 20, 30, whatever you want. Almost every, I think I had one patient in the last nine months come in and that's actually lost weight. Everybody else is sitting at home on a couch waiting to die. Yeah. Right. And, and, and to be honest with you, again, you know, you talk about the things that will save people's lives, things that will boost their immune system, right. In order to fight off or fend off a potential infection that could be life-threatening. Um, you know, these are the things that now it's not that we're encouraging, but just by default, by not engaging in those sorts of conversations, you know, I tell people that like, everybody comes in and says, oh, my gym is closed. My gym is closed. My gym is closed. So first of all, listen, not every gym is closed. That's nonsense. Yeah. Number two, the park is not closed. You can go to the park and you can work out. You can walk. I mean, the weather has been beautiful other than this last week, right? It's been gorgeous. Yeah. So people make excuses all the time. I mean, listen, you're, you're in the profession where you, you interview people every day, you know, right? Yeah. And you talk to them about, you know, how, what, it, what are your challenges? You know, what do you want, right? That's what you asked me when I first got yeah. there. What, what do you want? Um, in reality, you know, people always look to find the path of least resistance, which is not to do, not to get up and move. And oh, yeah, the gym is closed, so I can't work out. <laughs> you know, it, it, that's a little bit bizarre to me, you know, so we, we fight them all day long. That's nonsense. Listen, man, it's 50 degrees outside. Go yeah. for a walk. Yeah. So, okay. You're right, but nobody's talking about it. I mean, those are the two things. Again, the greatest drugs in the history of the world. But yeah, we're talking about all this other crap. You know, but we're not talking about the things that are life saving interventions. Again, I, I, you know, I'm not some militant. At the end of the day, we know this and it's no different today than it was five years or 10 years ago. Everybody knows the greatest thing in the history of the world, but nobody talks about it. You nobody. know, everybody wants to say, hey, listen, take this pill. You know, now it's going to be take this vaccine, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, and yet, hey, 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 the thing that's going to save your life is getting out there and breaking a sweat, man. That's yeah. going to save your life. The yeah. thing that's going to save your life is eating ridiculously healthy you know, investing in nutrients, you know, you know, intaking things that you know are going to boost your, uh, your immune system and fight that inflammation that's going to ultimately kill you either now or 10 years from now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, like I said, that's why it's a breath of fresh air hearing that from you, because that, that to me, just from the get go raised a red flag with, with this pandemic is no, none of these experts are talking about real health. And it's, uh, you know, it's just crazy. No, Wait. listen, I've been, I, you know, I've been going to your gym since it reopened, thank God, you know, yeah. and, 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 you know, and again, I'm not saying that maybe I'm just lucky, but, you know, we're all there, you know, in a very appropriate setting, everything is clean, you know, everything is spaced out. Um, and, and I've never felt better. Every time I go there, you know, that that's when the magic happens, you know, and yeah. then for the next couple of days, I feel like my body is a superhero. <laughs> you yeah. know? And, and, and I have not gotten sick. Thank God, knock on wood, you know, again, maybe just lucky, but no, I think common sense things. Uh, but again, boosting your immune system, you can do nothing better for yourself right now than to boost your immune system. The problem is right now, the liquor store is open, no problem, right? That's going to be open 24 hours a day for the rest of your life. It doesn't matter what kind of pandemic, the liquor store is yeah. open. So people are going to go and drink themselves to death, sit on a couch and, and watch Netflix all day. And, you know, but yet that's not the problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's just... It's bizarre world, man. I feel like I'm living in a twilight zone. I'm like, oh, I'm <laughs> man. <laughs> How about, um, let's talk about sodium, because this is one that, that I'm a big, and I, and I think, uh, you know, I don't think, I know that you're, you're more what I would call cutting edge, just because most people with sodium, especially doctors, keep sodium low. Sodium's the devil. Sodium's no good. So talk about sodium. Uh, what's your view on it, the importance of it? Hmm. Oh, man. You know, it pains me. <laughs> you know, it pains me because I feel like, you know, the, the smarter people get sometimes, the stupider they become. Uh, you know, and it's not a direct criticism directed towards one individual or another, but it's always like that whole thing. Like, remember how you grew up, you know, don't don't forget your past now. Remember where you came from. You know, those things are important um, because they teach you incredible life lessons. Um, listen, sodium, at least in the form that we know it, you know, it's not sodium in isolation of itself, right? The, the form that we talk about mainly is sodium chloride, right? Because that's really what we're ingesting. That's the predominance or, or the most common form of sodium that's available on the planet. Um, so we're talking about sodium chloride. Now, sodium, ironically enough, as you know, on the periodic table of elements is listed number one, right? So there's gotta be something good about it, right? <laughs> so that periodic table of elements that's responsible for everything that happens on this planet, in this world and in the universe, you know, it's listed number one, there's gotta be something to it. So let's talk about maybe the first why, why people 
um, or perhaps the, the medical arena is a little bit concerned about, you know, salt intake, in particular dietary salt intake. Um, because there have been data and evidence to suggest that it leads to hypertension, okay? So it causes high blood pressure. Um, listen, nobody's gonna argue that if you ingest sodium, okay, you are going to retain, okay, blood volume or fluid, right? Because again, we talked about early this concept of, um, of balance, you know, the body needing to maintain balance. You have to remember sodium is the major extracellular um, compound potassium, the major intracellular content. So when I say extra and cellular, we're talking about cells inside the body. So an oversimplification is simply a cell, very complicated process, but to break it down, tremendous amounts of sodium outside, potassium inside. Um, the reason that's important is because the balance between those two is ultimately what drives the way the body communicates with itself. It's the way the muscles contract, it's the way the heart contracts, it's the way the brain communicates. So Sodium has to move, right? You're talking about an ionic environment, right? Different ions, all right? So that balance has to maintain itself. So sodium drives itself into the cells in order for the body to maintain balance. Potassium has to then leave the cell. But by sodium driving itself into cells anywhere in the body, it changes what's called the action potential of nerves, of neurons in particular. But that's how your brain communicates. It's how your heart contracts. So it's such a vital element inside of the body. And you have to remember that we also have this thing called the kidney. The kidney is the ultimate filtration system inside of the body. And all day long, your kidney basically excretes sodium, but then retains most of it, right? So why does the body want to hold on to sodium? Well, because I just explained that the body requires salt in order to maintain those basic fundamental functions that allow the body to do all the day-to-day -day operational stuff. So it's just like drinking water. People talk about, you gotta drink so much water, so much water. You drink water, what happens when you drink water all day long? You go to the bathroom because your body has to pee it out. You need balance, it doesn't stay inside your body. The body has to get rid of it, why? Because you're diluting the content of sodium inside of the body and the body doesn't work that way. So it's gotta get rid of that water. Um, there definitely are things like stress as you related to that raises uh, inflammatory hormones like epinephrine, insulin, okay, these sorts of things, sure. So if you combine the perfect storm of somebody who's ridiculously stressed out, tremendously inflamed from morbid obesity, you know, abdominal obesity, you know, has insulin resistance, and you combine that with somebody who doesn't eat well and has more salt in their diet, yes, that's the perfect storm for somebody to really screw themselves up. But in reality, you, you could put as much table salt on as you want. Your body is, if, if you have normal kidney function, your body is just going to naturally adapt to the changes. And the other thing you have to remember is most salt, right? We usually consume 100% salt, at least the stuff that's produced from like factories and things like that. But if you go and eat sea salt, right? That's why sea salt's gotten a lot of popularity. It's only about 95% or 98% sodium chloride. The rest of it is these other micronutrients and elements that are in there. That's why sea salt is theoretically better than regular table salt. Now, both are fine, you know, but if you're going to choose one, take the sea salt because it has all these other micronutrients that the body also requires, you know, but in microscopic amounts. But I, I'm not a, a big fan of restricting salt unless it's specific patients like heart failure patients, right, who just don't have the ability to adapt anymore. Their kidney functions down their heart is weakened, it's not able to systemically circulate blood in, in an appropriate fashion. Um, but at the end of the day, no, it's, it's an essential mineral of the body. Um, it's globally important. Even the American College of Cardiology now recommends up to five grams of sodium intake per day. So there was a time the cardiologist said, don't ever eat sodium, salt's bad for you. <laughs> they recommend up to five grams, you know, and honestly, you could take 10 grams, you know, and, yeah. and you'd be perfectly fine. <laughs> so that, that's my take on sodium. <laughs> no, that's great, man, because when people ask me about supplements, that's the first thing I recommend. And I say, well, it's not a, it's a supplement because you're probably deficient. But so from what you're saying too, the body is a big electrical system. And, and that's where the term, I think electrolytes come from, right? But if sodium, yep. potassium are, are deficient, uh, for, for the average person, their their function is going to be uh, not as sharp. And then for in the gym or athletes, right, performance is going to decline if we're deficient in this stuff, correct? Yeah, again, it's, it's the basic fundamental. I mean, again, everything, electrical stuff happens before mechanical stuff. Right. So and we talk about that all the time. So you have to have, for example, when the heart contracts, 
the first thing that happens is electrical systole, electrical contraction. So you have to have the electrical firing of the electrical system before the heart muscle actually contracts. So the, the muscular action that you get in the gym, you know, when you're going at it, um, you know, you, you, what's happening right before that is the electrical system is actually firing, allowing that muscle to contract. So that's why those electrolytes, repleting them afterwards, uh, and obviously including them in your day-to-day, -day, you know, operational nutritional intake are so vitally important because if you can't have appropriate sound electrical function, how the hell are the muscles going to work? They don't work in isolation of each other. Yeah. One directly leads, leads to the contractile function of the other. Okay. Some of the muscles do have some independence, but in reality, you know, in order for that muscle to twitch, <laughs> you, you need that, you need that electrical to fire. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that's excellent. And two of the things uh, I think I've gone over in a couple of the seminars we did, but from my research on, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but when, when sodium is low, like most people, if, if they're very low in it, heart rate is going to go potentially up, which is more dangerous, right? Than a couple of points on blood pressure going up potentially from. Yeah. I listen. It's the first, I, I teach the medical students all the time. When a patient comes into the hospital and you go see them in the emergency room, if they're tachycardic, Okay, if they're just sitting there and their heart rate's 110, you better have those flags go up because there is something bad going on with that patient. Nobody should be sitting there with a heart rate of 110. I don't even care if it's normal, quote unquote, heart rate, meaning sinus tachycardia. Normally we're in sinus rhythm, which is a heart rate between, you know, anywhere between 60 and 100, et cetera. Anything over 100 is considered tachycardic or fast. That patient comes in and they're sitting there looking at you and they got a heart rate of 110 on the monitor, man, your antenna better go up because something's going on. Yeah. And it's usually not good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, I, and I've looked at stuff too, where, where lack of sodium can contribute to insulin resistance. And I, I think mm -hmm. a lot of people aren't even aware. So it's just like, it's such a powerful thing, I think, just to supplement with, you know, add a little extra to your food, put some in your water. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't advocate, you know, eating like, you know, uh, you know, stuff out of a can, you know, that's a little bit much, you know, even for me, I mean, you, you want to get dehydrated really fast, just eat soup out of a can. You know, if you're making your own soup, right. You know, you, you know, whatever your grandma's making your soup, whatever it is completely different, right. They're adding table salt. Right. But if you look at the milligrams, of course, there's a difference in composition. So I'm not advocating people just go out there and, and just eat endless amounts of salt. That's kind of retarded too, yeah. but you, you've got to look, right. You got to be smart about it. Again, it's not the extremes. It's kind of the balance in between, but you adding table salt, that is much table salt that makes your food taste good to your liking and then yeah. <laughs> leave it alone. And I, yeah, and I find that with salt too. If you overdo it, your body has a very strong mechanism to just doesn't taste good anymore. No, and then it doesn't feel good. It doesn't taste good, right? Yeah. You usually get a headache. You know, you just don't feel right. So again, the, the body is the ultimate machine, you know? And if you really listen is. to it, it tells you all the time. You're tired, sleep, you're hungry, eat. You know, you need to go. It even tells you when it's time to go work out, right? Yeah. Like, I got to move. It's like your body's sitting there telling you, I got to There's a reason for that. At a surface level, right, it's all philosophical, but in reality, it, it's all based on these very fundamental principles that are so complex. But we've been given this incredible machine that despite all the harm that we attempt to inflict on it every single day, somehow yeah. is able to function at the highest level. I mean, yeah. think about it. <laughs> it's really, mind blowing. It really is, man. It's fascinating. Uh, okay, a couple more. I'll be mindful of your time. Yeah. Um, tell me if this is correct. I, I think it was in uh, Johnny Bowden. I read, uh, I believe that's his name. It might've been him and Mercola, one of their books, but it was about cholesterol. And then for the lay, I guess for the layman, they were saying a way to assess heart risk factor would be to look at triglyceride ratio to HDL ratio. Any thoughts on that? Is that true or is that? Yeah, you know, I think it's one of those proposed hypotheses, um, you know, and I think there is like everything else, there, there is a little bit of something to it. Um, I think triglycerides in isolation, you know, are, are especially high ones, you know, that you see, especially I'm sure you've seen it throughout the course of your professional career yeah. lifting. And, you know, all you got to do is, you know, get a get a bodybuilder, you know, who's consuming tremendous amount of carbohydrates, check their triglycerides and in the thousands. Right. So, you know, you, you've got to be careful with that. Um, there's also lipoproteins like little lipoprotein A and B. You know, these tends these things do tend to be much more thrombogenic in nature, uh, meaning they have a propensity to cause more inflammation, leading to, you know, higher clot formation, things like that. Um, so, yeah, I think there there is a there there. Um, you know, I try, as I said earlier, not to take one thing in isolation. 
you know, of the other, I look at them all, you know, kind of equally and then try to see how they, they communicate with one another. But, you know, probably the best thing that we see is when people have a high HDL. You know, if you're walking around with an HDL of 80 or above, you're cooking with gas. I mean, you're, you're doing really well. Those people do really, really, really well. I don't care what their other cholesterol parameters are. And we see it all the time. Listen, I took care of a guy, a heart attack over the weekend. His cholesterol is perfectly normal. You know, so that's why I tell physicians all the time. So explain to me how many people we see with a normal cholesterol coming with a heart attack, right? If cholesterol is the problem, okay, explain to me why this guy had a heart attack because his cholesterol is better than mine. <laughs> you know, and we see that all the time. You know, that's why I just try to encourage people, just, just question, ask. Again, it's part of the story. It's not the whole story. And everybody is completely different. Yeah, that's, that's great, man. So a couple more I made notes on here. These might be obscure. I, don't, I mean, it's uh, just good stuff that was on my mind. We talked about, I know in, in our workshops together, our seminars, talk about whole food, plant-based, mainly, you know, majority of the time eating that way. But homocysteine uh, located within animal protein I've, re I've read recently that that's 40 times greater predictor uh, uh, than cardiovascular disease than, than cholesterol, homocysteine. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that? Um, yeah, that goes in with that whole, you know, folate, you know, complex and things of that nature and ensuring the adequate folate levels, um, you know, homocysteine. Again, the these things were put into play 40 years ago. I remember reading this even pre-medical school, but it never got any play. You couldn't read it in a journal. You have to read it like in the New York Times or something like that, where they, some science article, <clears throat> that somebody picked up on it, um, you know, and kind of ran with it. But yeah, absolutely. Hyper homocysteinemia, um, you know, folate deficiency, um, again, tied in with C-reactive protein. These things are very closely linked together. Um, and again, it goes back to that whole inflammatory process. So absolutely, there's no doubt about it. The things that are pro-inflammatory are really the cornerstone of chronic disease. And it's not only cardiovascular disease. We also talk about the number two killer on the planet, which is cancer. You know, think of how many people we know have cancer, you know, and probably more now than ever, right? It's almost like an epidemic of cancer, um, you know, that we see. And that's all directly related to all of this inflammatory nonsense. I mean, there was a great article, you know, I'm not sure you guys saw a year ago or a couple of years ago that was talking about these telomeres um, and telomere length. I'm not sure yeah. if you've heard it. So, and these things, and I, and I mentioned that because again, it's directly related to stress, inflammation so things that lead to inflammation like hyperhomocysteinemia so what telomeres are so if everybody remembers you have a chromosome a chromosome is basically the the fundamental uh computing coding unit of your body that's how we are who we are um and you have dna dna is responsible for doing that but on the end of these strands right you have these cross linked strands at the tips of them they're almost like uh, bumper car bumpers you know they're called telomeres right they're non-coding non-protein areas the longer the telomere okay um uh, versus the shorter the tumor, the longer the telomere, which basically protects the coding unit. So if this is the coding unit and this is the telomere, really short, this stress, inflammation, hyperhomocysteinemia, CRP levels, all this stuff actually cleave this portion, this telomere. Once that telomere is gone, then all you're left with is the DNA or the computing coding complex of the chromosome. And that's how the damage starts to happen. So the longer these are, okay, the more resistant you are. So like in intermittent fasting, for example, right, makes you resistant to stress mediated injury. Okay, so the longer these telomeres are, they found that these people not only live longer, they have less cancer, they have less cardiovascular disease and so forth, because it's protective to the mechanism that keeps your body alive. All right, this is the thing that allows you to have the health span versus the lifespan. Right. So when you when you denude these things, when you get rid of them, so that's why it becomes so important. So we're starting to understand really when people talk about this, you and I sit here and, you know, we know next to nothing. Right. We just talk about this stuff and we get excited. But in reality, there's a basic fundamental yeah. principle happening. And we're starting to understand that, yeah, there's a reason why exercise is good. Right. Because when you ask most people, well, why is exercise good? Well, it makes me feel better. Well, why does it make you feel better? And then you start kind of, you know, unwrapping the layers. And we're getting down now to the chromosomal aspects of why these things are beneficial, because they are completely protective of your body's infrastructure that allows it to protect itself from the, the marauding invaders, right? We're always under attack all day long from stress, from environmental exposures, the crap that the, you know, these corporations put into our food and products and stuff like that. Um, you know, so our body's always under attack. And so what we need to do is equip it with all the potential things that prevent those things from happening that then, you know, uh, manifest themselves in these chronic illnesses. Yeah. Yeah. Right on, man. That's, uh, that's excellent, man. I could talk all day to you about this, man. I love learning <laughs> Fun, this. Man. 
<laughs> with, uh, one more thing I want to ask about, but just so people are clear too, homocysteine is, is that that's primarily from animal flesh foods. Animal flesh foods. Okay, so animal flesh type of foods, because people are asking, now, why did I make the switch? I'm not vegetarian. I just cut way back on my animal protein. Yeah. Animal protein can potentially lead to a lot more inflammation in the body. Absolutely. If you consume it regularly on a daily basis, I mean, we have evidence. If you eat meat every day there's a 40% increase in the likelihood of you having a cardiovascular event, having a heart attack, stroke, or dying prematurely from something heart related. So there's no doubt about it. But again, that's the extreme, you know, but there are some people that do consume meat every single day. You know, I used to be that guy. <laughs> I'm not that guy anymore. Um, so I, I would never say meat is bad for you. That would be absolutely false. It is not. Meat can be extremely powerful. It has, again, a lot of nutrients, iron, all sorts of things in there that can be vitally important, you know, again, to the construct of what we do. Um, but yes, the more we move away, and especially the way meat is produced, there used to be a time you'd go to McDonald's, man, when you and I were growing up and the food was real. The yeah. food was real. It's not real anymore. <laughs> so, you know, so there's difference and there's a difference in the type of meat that you eat, right? There's hamburger and there's filet mignon. So there is a difference in the quality of the meat and how it's produced. Um, so those are important things to remember. So I tell people, listen, you know, if you enjoy meat, enjoy it, but do it once a week. Don't do it five days a week because yes, it's not going to be good for you. Um, so you have to incorporate it into this larger, I mean, my favorite book in the last couple of years is the, uh, the blue zone diet. Yeah. I'm not sure if you've seen the blue. Yeah. It's such a great book. I mean, it looks at basically all of these, um, these areas around the world, basically national geographic went around and found all these places around the world where people routinely lived above a hundred years of age. And they found commonality, you know, in all of these different populations yeah. spread out all around the world, how they ate, but the irony wasn't just about eating. It was about socialization, human interaction. They would walk to their neighbor, right, to eat. You know, every night they would have dinner. You know, they would have a glass of wine, but the glass is not that big. The glass was that big, you know? So, you know, and everything was legumes, freshly prepared. They all had their own gardens. I mean, so th things have changed a lot, but there still are places, you know, like Okinawa and Sardinia where, where people still live routinely into their hundreds. You know, it's an incredible thing. And they have a lot of fundamental things that they share I think that are core principles that we need to focus on. And it's certainly not drugs. Yeah. And I think, like you said, a lot of people want to try to extrapolate and just say, this is what they're eating. But like you said, it's the social, it's the stress management. It's Everything. all, you know, to the last one. And this one might be obscure. I don't know. It popped in my head. So years ago, I read a book, The Truth About uh, Raw Milk. I got another <laughs> milk book I'm reading. But they were talking about within it. I always tell people now, man, pasteurized dairy is, to, to me, it's the devil. But um with something and i think this was in european journals i haven't seen it anywhere here but skim milk xanadine oxidates how that can get right into the because it's homogenization how it's pulverized can you talk about uh if you're familiar with that i'm sure you are but like because skim milk a lot of times prescribed as a, a good healthy food mm -hmm. but you get this enzyme that can get right into the arteries because it's been pulverized so little smashing of the fat particles um what, just speak briefly about that, like skim milk and pasteurized milk. If you have any you know, I, to summarize it up, my, my general feeling is it's poison. Okay, that's right. <laughs> it's absolute, I mean, I don't know what else to say about it, but again, it's what these, uh, you know, and I, and I hate, you know, you hate to kind of blame, you, you, you know, a, an entirety, you know, of a, of a system, but it, it is an organizational, um, you know, what, what has happened to our food in this nation is, is criminal. Um, and again, when you and I were growing up, it was very different. You know, milk was milk. Milk is not milk anymore. I don't know what you want to call it. They call it milk on the box, man. They call it skim milk, this milk, that milk. I don't know what you're drinking anymore. It was an essential growing up. Now I, I tell people I would avoid it at all costs because I honestly don't even know half the compounds they put in that stuff. So to me, dairy... Again, I, I like cheese. I think cheese, you know, certain cheeses are very good with so regota cheese or part skim mozzarella, whatever it is. You can still find good dairy products in the dairy section. Milk no longer is one of them as far as I'm concerned for the exact reason that you're mentioning. Excellent, excellent. Well, this has been very enlightening. I'm sure you got, uh, it's about nine o'clock patients to start seeing for the day. Well, tell people, uh, Dr. Andre, though, because I do have a lot of people that uh, you know, the word is that they know about you, but where can people find, like people are looking for a, do a doctor such as yourself that's knowledgeable, that's caring, that's patient. Where can they find more information about you to possibly schedule an appointment with you? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we've got a website. It's, uh, you know, it's hundredandheartandvascular.com. Uh, 
And, you know, we're local here in Flemington. Uh, you know, I used to be a part of a large, you know, organization now, you know, I went out specifically for this reason to be able to, you know, interact and have normal conversations with people like you and just kind of take my life back. So I'm basically on my own. I'm a solo practicing physician. Um, and yeah, and we, and we take time. We, we love to educate our patients. You know, for me, medicine is not about uh, anything other than the, the interaction that we have. The medicine part is easy. You know, I can give people drugs all day long. You know, it's the easiest thing in the world, right? And we try to avoid doing that all the time. And we tell people when they walk in, listen, you know, we, we, we're not a drug factory. You know, if you need drugs, we'll give them. Listen, there's no doubt about it. There are people out there that require pharmacology. You know, they just have conditions that of no fault of their own, you know, and they, they require supplementation. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, but our goal is never that. Our focus is to focus on the individual, you know, just like you do identify your challenge. What are you trying to achieve? You know, are you trying to kill yourself? Or are you one of these people like everybody else that you don't want to kill yourself? You just don't know how to not kill yourself. So <laughs> our responsibility, or we find ourselves more often than not spending a tremendous amount of time educating people, you know, on how to care for themselves. And, um, you know, and, and we like that interaction. You know, we really view our interaction more as a, a family friendly mediated environment. My job is not to tell people what to do. You know, my job is to tell intelligent people, you know, as much knowledge that I've acquired over my life. Th this is what I know. You know, here's some resources where you can acquire some different knowledge. Ultimately, as the as the consumer of what I'm sharing with you, you've got to make a decision what's best for you, you know, because everybody's an individual. But we're, you know, you could just call our office. I mean, you know, we're pretty busy. There's no doubt about it. Um, but, you know, we love seeing new patients. Um, you know, we love focusing on things and interacting with your organization. I mean, like I said, I, you know, again, plug for you. I, I go there myself and it's saved my life. You know, I was struggling for a really, really, really long time because I had a really bad knee injury. Um, I was telling Mike the other day when I went there a couple of weeks ago, was, you know, he always asks me about my knee because I couldn't stop talking about it. Like the first six months I was there, I was like, I don't even know my knee is a problem anymore. You know, and, and I said, because, you know, I've been routinely going there for the last couple of years. So I, the beautiful thing is I can attest to what I'm talking about. It's not just me saying, hey, listen, go exercise. You know, that's what most doctors do. Well, you got to exercise and you got to eat well. You know, well, that's not really helpful. That's not what people need. There's a way to exercise, right? I mean, you could sit here and the conversation could be reversed. And I'm asking you, you know, Kyle, how does one exercise? How does one achieve those goals? You know, that's your expertise. And that's why I go there. You know, I'm not, I'm not a sports physiologist. You know, sure, I've got training in a lot of that stuff. But I go to your program because that's where the experts are. When I have a question, you know, I ask Mike or Coach Paul or, you know, and say, hey, listen, you know, how do you know, even I, I, who was the guy? It was Will? Um, yeah, Will. Yeah, he's, I miss uh, Will was the best. He used to kill me, <laughs> but he was the best. He, you know, my, my goal was to do pull ups, you know, and, and I really didn't know how to get there, you know. And yeah. he basically said to me, man, you know, after every workout, so mind you, I was dead, you know, 45, 50 minutes, and you can't even walk out of the place, you know, but he would force me to go over, you know, basically to the pull down bar, the lap bar, yeah. you know, and do, you do a couple of reps of those, you know, he's like, that's the only way you're going to be able to pull yourself up, you know, and then lo and behold, fast forward a few years. So again, the knowledge is out there and everybody has it. You know, the goal is to share it amongst each other. That's the only way we move forward. Yeah. And, and the, the beautiful thing about what you do, Andre, is, is you lead by example. So you're doing, you're not, you're, you're doing it, you know, and, and also from, from just not your profession, but I do, you're constantly learning. I mean, you're sending me, you send me article books, all the, you're constantly on the cutting edge. So you're not, you have the open, you have the empty cup, you know, mindset, which I love, man. That's awesome. Yeah. So. I mean, the more I know, the less I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Every time I read something like, wow, how I did not know this and how I've been called a doctor for the last 20 years and I didn't know this, that's scary. So that's the thing. It frightens me into saying, my God, sure. I've got to continue to maintain that level of intensity and passion for education because there's so many things out there that we don't know, man. We're just scratching the surface. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, right on, man. Well, let me just bring this to a close. Give me 